Uh, we're going to talk tonight about stretching the heavens. That phrase occurs 17 times at least in the Scripture. Stretching the heavens and the dilation of time. We've talked a little bit about that in a number of our previous studies, but I get so many questions in this general area that we decided to go at it. There, all of us face a fundamental di- dilemma. How many of you in the room recognize that the universe appears to be something in the order of 16 billion years old. How many know that? Now, see, some of you may not know that, but that's because you're not informed. If you're in astronomy, if you're an astrophysicist, there's all kinds of evidence to indicate the universe is 16 billion years old. But let me ask you again, how many of you know that the age of the universe is that old? My hand is up, by the way. Well, let's say I just got a feeling. Okay, we've got less than, okay. Of course, the other question is, how many of you believe that the universe was created in 144 hours or six days? How many there? See, that's the politically correct response in this group. (laughs) But that's the dilemma. How many of you have been confronted by your children or somebody else trying to reconcile the apparent age of the universe, on the one hand, with the idea that it was created, created in six days? How many have run into that problem? How many feel they can handle that problem? Okay, good. Good for you. Anyway, (laughs) all right. Well, that's really one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the things we're going to try to touch on tonight as we explore this, and we're going to try to do it from the Scriptures. Now, I have a few snapshots here. This happens to be M33, and it's um, measured by a number of different techniques as being about 2 million light years away. Now, a light year is is a measure of distance. It's how far light can travel in one year. And it's something just a little short of six trillion miles. Big. That's a long way, you know. Feels like a freeway sometimes, I imagine. But it's anyway. M101. It's clocked at about 18 million light years away. Now, this is just a very difficult thing to deal with because the experts who have tried to attack this from a Christian point of view really don't have any good arguments. It appears to be about 18 million light years away. Uh, here is M51, 25 million light years away. And uh, NGC, 32 million light. These are all, the, I just have, I've selected here some spiral galaxies for another reason I'll come to later in the discussion. And uh, here, yeah, uh, that was 32 million light years. Here's uh, M88 at about 65 million light years. Now these, the, and there's one more here, NGC 772, which is apparently about 106 million light years away. Spiral galaxies. Now, this leads, of course, to the fundamental questions. Is the universe, in fact, 15 billion years old? Well, that's a difficulty, because there are those that try to attack that, but it's hard to find scientific evidence to attack that. I'm not talking about the age of the Earth now. That's a whole other thing, the age of the universe. And uh, the whole we all know about the Hubble telescope, named after Edwin Hubble, who formulated what they call Hubble's Law when it was observed in the 20s primarily that the light from the stars tends to get shifted to the red. That is, the spectrum of the star gets shifted to the red. Uh, He noted that the further away they are, the more they get shifted, and that led to what's called the red shift. And one of the conjectures supporting the red shift was the idea that the reason they're shifted to the red is that they're racing away from us. And uh, uh, by something... analogous to the Doppler effect. At least that's been the conventional wisdom. And uh, that's called Hubble's Law, and one reason the telescope's named it that. But the question that we struggle with, of course, is because the Scripture would indicate that the universe is created in just six days. And that's a different issue of what happened after the six days. But one of the ways that some people try to get around this is say, well, yes, these things are so many billion light years away, but when God created the universe these things were, the light was created in transit to look like it was that far away. That's a view. And, uh, uh, and many, uh, uh, many people hold that view. That would imply that the aging factors in our universe were built in. And uh, I personally have trouble with that because that would make God a deceiver. Others like the, uh, also wrestle with this idea that the uh, days of Genesis were geological ages. One day is a thousand years. So they use that excuse to say, well, these were not just thousands of years. They may be millions of years, but they try to match the six days described in Genesis with the various geological ages. And there's many creative attempts to try to reconcile it, 
but at least as far as I personally am concerned, um, that dog don't hunt, as they would say down south, okay? <laughs> so we're going to get into this a little bit, but in order to do so, on any of these kinds of ideas, one of the things we need to leave behind is the baggage of misconceptions or preconceptions that we carry to a subject. If you take any um, class in paradox resolution or in epistemology, one of the things you realize is that many problems are appear to be unsolvable because we impute to the problem preconceptions that are incorrect. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this idea of time. And to do this, uh, I'm going to uh, indulge a little bit in some things that we've talked about in the past. This may be repetitive to some of you. In the field of trigonometry, if we have a triangle, and here I've got a 30, 60, 90 triangle, uh, if I add up the degrees, that triangle adds up to how much? 180 degrees. How many knew that? Okay, good. We're together. Okay, that's great. Okay, it's about 1,900 out of 2,000. That's about right. Okay. If I have a 45, uh, 45, 90, same thing. It adds up to 180 degrees. Now, suppose we go out into a large field here, and uh, we lay out a very large triangle, and uh, we discover that the angles in the, this triangle adds up to more than 180 degrees. We discover, say, let's say there's 70 degrees in each corner. And uh, we come back and it's 210 degrees. What would you conclude? Well, Chuck Missler screwed up again. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, what we have, if we find such a triangle, what, would, what have we encountered? Good for you, the curvature of the Earth. If you have a triangle with more than 180 degrees in its three corners you are in a convex surface. If you have a triangle with less than 180 degrees in all three corners, you have a concave surface. The point is, this little rule that we were taught in school is only true for a, a universe of two dimensions. That's why it's called plane trigonometry or plane geometry, a single plane. It's a two-dimensional universe. And when you discover something that violates that rule, it's a clue that you've encountered an additional dimension. That little rule for two dimensions doesn't apply to three. And so that's exactly the kind of insight that caused Dr. Albert... And by the way, an example of this is if you take a course in navigation, celestial navigation with a sextant and so on, you have to learn not plane trigonometry alone. You have to learn spherical trigonometry in which you can have a triangle with 90 degrees in each corner. And uh, But anyway, it was this kind of an insight that caused Dr. Albert Einstein to initiate an entire revolution in our understanding of the physical universe. He formulated his, spe his special theory of relativity in 1905, which essentially says that length, mass, and velocity, and time are relative to the observer's own velocity. If you have two different observers traveling at different velocities, these, the length, mass, velocity, and time themselves actually are, are, are perceived differently. But that was a special theory. About 10 years later, he formulated what's called the general theory of relativity. And this, we won't get into the mathematics of it, obviously. That's not our interest tonight. But the main insight that derives from this is that there really is no distinction between time and space. Now, you and I have trouble with that because we can move in two directions, or three directions, I mean, different, back and forth in each dimension of three-dimensional space. And time has a strange property because it's unidirectional. You, you move forward, you can move forward and look back, you can't move back or look forward, right? I usually ask, uh, uh, any of you remember tomorrow? I always ask that hesitatingly when I'm in California, but... <laughs> yeah. Einstein recognized that we live in at least a four-dimensional continuum, and this is no longer really a theory. It's been confirmed uh, 12 different ways to 14 decimals, and it's pretty well accepted. Now, the main point for you and I to understand is that time is a physical property. You, we exist in more than three dimensions. The particle physicists would uh, suggest that we live in at least ten. But time itself is a physical property. And time varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. And that's a very difficult insight to grasp because we're so used to just experiencing it in our world. Let's talk about gravity for the moment. There is an atomic clock, a cesium clock, at the National Bureau of Standards in Boulder, Colorado. This kind of a clock is accurate to one millionth of a second per year. There is an identical clock at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. Now, these two clocks are identical. However, the one in Boulder, Colorado, 
runs about five millionths of a second faster each year than the one in Greenwich. Boulder runs faster than Greenwich. But the point is, which of these two clocks are correct? How can they both be correct? Because one's not a lot, but measurably different. They're both correct. Boulder, Colorado, the National Bureau of Standards in Boulder, is about 5,400 feet in altitude above sea level. The, observe, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England, is 80 feet above sea level. There's a difference in altitude, therefore a difference in time. Not a lot, but measurable. At the United States Naval Observatory, now, now we're changing to the Naval Observatory in uh, Washington. In 1971, a couple of guys, J.C. Hafley and uh, Richard Keating, they got four of these extremely accurate cesium clocks, and they sent them around the world in airplanes. And it's a very colorful story in terms of the headaches they had at customs and all the rest of it. But the point is, they sent them around the world. The ones that were sent around the world eastward ran 59 nanoseconds, or 0 0.059 microseconds, slower than the one that was at rest at the observatory. The ones that they sent around the world westward gained 273 nanoseconds, or 0.273 microseconds, over the others. Not a lot, not a lot, but if you account for the Earth's rotation and some other factors, it's exactly what Einstein's theory would have predicted. But the point is that time changed. So these are demonstrations, the atomic clocks I've mentioned, the aircraft experiment. There's another example that's frequently indulged in in most physics texts, and, that, and that's where we imagine two identical astronauts born at the same instant. One we're going to leave right here with us. The other we're going to send to the nearest star, which happens to be Alpha Centauri. It's about four and a half light years away. If we send him there at half the speed of light and have him come back, that's, four, that's 18 years round trip. But when he gets back, he'll discover that he's two years and nine months younger than his twin brother. And if that doesn't bother you, you weren't listening carefully. <laughs> Let me extend it a little further, and there's some assumptions here that I won't quibble over. But if I take the Lorentz transformations, that's what we're talking about here to make these comparisons. If we send this guy, assuming we could, at 99.99% of the speed of light to the star and back, then it would take him four and a half years to get there, four and a half years back to so us, nine years round trip. During that time he's gone, the Earth will have aged 636 years. So you hope he bought some Microsoft stock before he left. But in any case, <laughs> all these examples are intending to do is get us to understand that time is a physical property and subject to change. Your clock and my clock may run differently if we're going, if we're under different gravitational situations, if we're going at different velocities and so forth. I should say different accelerations, but anyway. There's a wonderful quote by Albert Einstein, it's one of my favorites. He says, people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Somebody said that God invented time so that everything wouldn't happen all at once. See? So if we think of time as a line, and I've, I've curved this line to suggest that it's in three-dimensional space, that's at linear time. Back there is the past. We're right here in the present. There's the future ahead of us. If we are living in eternity, free of the constraints of time, then we can see the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. And that's what God says he does. I alone know the end from the beginning. Now, you can reverse this, too, by the way. You want to get cute about this? Let's, let's say the people in the past, let's represent that by someone who died a thousand years ago. The people in the present will talk about someone who died yesterday. And the people in the future say someone that got raptured a week from Tuesday. They all might arrive at the throne of grace at the same instant. I'm not saying they do. I'm just trying to stretch your perception of these things. Well, let's jump into Genesis chapter 1 and find out what the designer says because he's the only guy that was there. With all due respect, I can name a number of apologists, even some Christian apologists, that I don't believe were there watching. Okay, So while we may enjoy their books and conjectures, uh, we should recognize that everybody is just indulging in just that, conjectures. Let's see what God said about it. Genesis chapter 1, you know the, uh, the verses. Dig into it and have it in front of you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. We could spend a week talking about that verse. Seven words. In the Hebrew, there are volumes of rabbinical literature written about that first verse. 
The very shape of the letters turn out to be relevant, by the way. But we'll keep moving on. And the earth was without form and void. The word was actually is a transitive verb implying an object, but I won't start on that one. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved or brooded, if you will, upon the face of the waters. The word moved there is like a hen moves over her eggs, if you will. And then we have the first direct quote of God in the Bible. And God said, let light be, or the way we translate it here, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Let's pause for a minute. How can you divide light from the darkness? I thought darkness was the absence of light. We use that term to denote the absence of light. But God is dividing the light from the darkness. And what it might have in view here is not darkness like you and I think of it, but more like a black hole. Something which light cannot escape from. It's quite a different thing. But let's move on. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were day one. Or it's translated the first day. Very strange thing. In this particular day, it's called day one. It's expressed absolutely, implying time was created at this point. All the rest of the days are relative days. Second day, third day, fourth day. This day, The Hebrew doesn't really say first day. It says day one. There's a difference. One is a relative term. The other is an absolute term. But our problem cosmologically, is really not from Genesis 1. Our problem really occurs in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Right in the middle of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, God says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see, many people, as a analyze Genesis 1, get all hung up with the word yom, the word for day. It occurs 1,143 times in the Scripture. And almost all those times it means day, like you and I think of it, but there are some times where the word day is used a little broader, metaphorically. The day of the Lord is not a 24-hour day, it's an era, and so forth. You know, So they quibble. The problem isn't from Genesis 1, the problem is Exodus 20, verse 11. Why? Because it's clear that God intends us to understand this as having taken place in six days. Not six periods that, you know, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the sea, the heavens and the earth and the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and held it to commemorate that. You say, well, gee, that might be just a metaphor. Well, the scripture is straightforward. I don't deny that there are metaphors. In fact, let me tell you candidly, the, the uh, Hosea 12.10 tells us, God says that uh, I have spoken by the prophets and used similitudes and other things. The, the Holy Spirit does use figures. Um, you know, whenever I'm challenged by a skeptic, you know, you take the Bible literally, I usually try to avoid saying it that way because I know where they're going. Well, if you take the Bible literally, then God has feathers. Why? Because of Psalm 91, under his wings thou shalt trust. Come on. Get serious. I discovered this accidentally. Don Stewart and I were on a talk show. Someone calling in was quick, all upset because we were taking the Bible. Uh, and when I responded to him, I, I, I was going to—I started to say we take the Bible literally, and I realized where that was headed. So I just stumbled. I said, "We take the Bible seriously." And the guy on the phone got so upset, I knew I struck oil. You know. <laughs> See, if I had said literally, as I'm about to, I know what he would have said. He would, we'd get that whole quibble about figures of speech. And I said, he wasn't willing to say he took the Bible less seriously than we did, and yet he was, because he's willing to allegorize the whole Scripture thing. Now, there are figures of speech in the Bible. There are allegories. There are metaphors. There are similes. There are analogies. Those are different. They're very similar, but not exactly the same kind of thing. How many different kinds of rhetorical devices do you think the Holy Spirit uses in the Scripture? Make a guess. Seven. Good guess, but wrong. That's okay. <laughs> we have, as an appendix, as an appendix in our book on cosmic codes, we have a list of rhetorical devices defined and then a Scripture as an example of where it's used. Do you know how many there are in there? 
over 200 different kinds of rhetorical devices defined and exampled. And uh, so, the, but the scripture is all, and even though it may use figures of speech to communicate. Its intent is always, the Holy Spirit uses puns. There's all kinds of puns in the scripture, right? You know, we speak of water, the washing of the water by the word. The water is always what? The word of God, living water, right? Then in Revelation, we see the saints standing on what? The glassy sea. You see, here we wash in it, there we stand on it. What is he talking about? The word of God. That's, uh, that's idiomatically a form of pun, if you will. Um, there are all kinds of examples of that throughout the Scripture. But that, it's always straightforward. And, and uh, Scripture even says that in Proverbs 8. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understands and right to them that find knowledge. Now, the word plain there is nakoch, which means straightforward. See, the word uh, plain means, in the Hebrew, plain. <laughs> okay? Now, we looked over the first six verses. Let's pick up on verse 7 and 8 in Genesis 1. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. What's the firmament? Has any kids asked you that when you read Genesis? What's the firmament? Um, that's a tough one. The word in the Hebrew is rakia. And in the Hebrew, it means an extended surface or expanse, but it usually implies a solid expanse. Well, the skeptics will say, well, this is just an echo of the Hebrew from the ancient tradition that the world was inside a large, you know, large sphere or something, a solid sphere, and the stars were holes in it or something. You know, some of these ancient Greek myths, they, so they impute those to the Hebrews. No, 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 no. By the way, the Greek translation of this in the, in the Septuagint is stereoma, which is, again, means firmness. In the Vulgate, the Latin, it's called firmamentum, which means a three-dimensional solidity or firmness. What's interesting, yes, it means expanse, but it implies solid expanse somehow. And that's in the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Latin picks that up, and that's where we call it firmament in, in our English translation typically. Is it solid or firmness? It's interesting, in Proverbs 8.28, it says, When he made firm the skies above. Are the skies above firm? You know, I always remark that when I moved away from Los Angeles, I don't trust air I can't see, you know. <laughs> but I don't think that's what he's talking about. Job 37.18, Can you with him spread out the skies, strong as a molten or cast mirror? Another strange idiom used here by God. Can you, with him, spread out the skies like a molten, you know, like a, like a solid cast mirror? It applies solidity again, doesn't it? Strange stuff. Now, when we're talking about space, I want you to notice that the firmament is not the heavenly bodies. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens, again. And, uh, and God made two great lights. He made the stars also, and he set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. So whatever this firmament thing is, it's the medium, if I can use that term, within which the stars are set. It's, a, it's what you and I would call space. Okay? In Job 9.8, it says, God who alone stretches out the heavens. What a strange expression. He's not talking about skies now. He's going far beyond that. In Psalm 104, verse 2, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. Isaiah 40, 22, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. In Jeremiah 10, 12, he has stretched out the heavens. And Zechariah 12, 1, the Lord who stretches out the heavens. This occurs 17 times in the Scripture. 2 Samuel 22.10. A couple more times in Job 26.7 37.18. Several times in the Psalm. Psalm 18.9 and 144.5. In Isaiah, we not only have 40.22, we have 42.5, 44.24, 45.12, 48.13, 51 51.13. Jeremiah mentions it twice, not only in 10.12, but 51.15. And Ezekiel picks it up in 1.22 and so on. So I'm going to suggest to you this metaphor, if it is a metaphor, it's used very frequently. 
Now, one of the things that we want, as we get in to try to understand, one of the things we need to understand is, what do we mean by empty space? The vacuum of space. We get the idea of space is empty. I'm not talking about the debris in there, satellites and other meteors, the space itself. Well, first of all, we should understand that science has done us a great favor because the scientists have discovered, have determined that the universe had a beginning. There are a lot of theories to the contrary that have been disproven scientifically. The universe had a beginning. The various models that attempt to contain what we think we know mathematically and physically about our universe are, tr are in, in, in embedded in what they call the Big Bang models. But the Big Bang is a collective term because they know it, it, it started what they call a singularity. At that singularity, not only was matter and energy begun, but space and time had a beginning. And that's a shock to many laymen who first start reading in, in the field of cosmology or astrophysics to realize that not only matter and energy had a start, but that space had a beginning and time had a beginning. That's a great service to those of us that have a biblical viewpoint because it's exactly what the Bible has said all along. But the way they talk about it, they, you know, science is not committed to the quest for truth. They like to parade like they are. Science is not committed to the quest for truth because if they're going after truth, they'll follow the evidence. No, science, scientists will go to great lengths to try to contrive an explanation that uh, is outside the bounds of supernatural intervention by our Creator. His attempt to explain things mechanistically. So the, they, they come up with what they call the Big Bang. You want a summary of the Big Bang. John Leffler gave me the greatest summary of the Big Bang yeah, some time ago. It says, first there was nothing, and then it exploded. That's exactly that sums it up. Now, the other end of this, thermo, you know, thermodynamically, is the universe is heading for termination. I'm speaking just in terms of physics now. It had a beginning. We know that mathematically and physically. But we also know it's winding down. We'll come to that in a little bit, called entropy. And it goes to what they call ultimate heat death. Now, the Big Bang models, there was originally a steady-state model. Einstein said that was his biggest mistake. It's associated with that. There's a hesitation model that was refuted in the 60s. There was the oscillation. These are all different variations of details about the so-called Big Bang concept. The oscillation model was refuted by the entropy laws. Then there was a thing called the inflation model that's very popular still for some reasons, but it requires anti-gravity forces that have never been observed. Plus, It's a model. It's an attempt to model what we think we know, and it's self-contradictory in some respects. I'm not going to go through this for lots of reasons. First of all, most of them are starting to fall in disrepute for a variety of reasons. But the idea that the universe has expanded to where it is from a point originally is the basic concept that scientists are trying to grapple with, trying to model what we think we know. Well, one of the questions you want to get in mind is you understand the universe is not infinite. It's finite. It had a finite beginning, and it expanded to its present size during some finite period of time. What is the apparent stretch factor? It turns out, through atomic physics and other uh, considerations, that stretch factor is a factor, it's an exponential factor, but about 10 to the 12th. And uh, for those of you that are technical, the temperature of the quark confinement is 10 to the 12th. That's when matter frees out energy. You take the ratio of 10 to the 9th, 10.9 uh, to 10 to the 12th divided in, in degrees Kelvin, divided by absolute zero in degrees Kelvin, which is 2.73, and you get what they call the, uh, the quark coefficient. Now, putting it another way, if the expansion factor, and we could go through several ways that scientists have believed that's an approximation of the expansion factor. Well, if you have 16 billion years, which is the very widely accepted estimate among scientists, if you multiply that into days, you multiply by 365, you get about 6 million million days, right? And if you divide that by the stretch factor, you get what? Six days. And I'm indebted to Dr. Gerald Schroeder. He's a good friend who lives in Jerusalem. He's a world-famous nuclear physicist, um, participated in six atomic bomb blasts. He also wrote a book called Genesis and the Big Bang. You probably won't find it in your Christian bookstores because he's an Orthodox Jew. And he looks, at, he looks at Genesis 1 from a Jewish perspective. But he's also a competent physicist, and, th and this is his way of summarizing this. Now, there are some oversimplifications here. This is actually an exponential Expansion. So day, the, the 15 and three-quarter billion years wouldn't be uniformly, it would be about 8 billion day, day one, 
then four, then two, then one, then a half, then a quarter. But anyway, it still is at about 15 and three quarters uh, is the way this properly. I did it summary to make it easier to understand. But the real thing about space is that it's not an empty vacuum. You and I, from science fiction stories or movie stuff, we think of empty space as empty. I don't mean that it isn't subject to meteors or cosmic rays. No, no. We think of the vacuum as absolutely empty. Well, the scripture doesn't say that. Isaiah 64.1 says that it can be torn. How can you tear space? Psalm 102, verse 25 says it, it can be worn out like a garment. Um, Hebrews 12.26, Haggai 2.6, and Isaiah 13.13 13 says it can be shaken. How can you shake empty space? Um, 2 Peter 3.12 alludes to it says it can be burnt up. Revelation uses an interesting expression, chapter 6, verse 14. It can be split apart like a scroll. Uh, it can be rolled up. Hebrews 1.12 and Isaiah 34.4 uh, uh, speak of it being rolled up like a mantle or, or like a scroll. This is empty space. Well, let's rolled up. Let's think what that tells us. If space can be rolled up, first of all, there must be some dimensionality in which it's thin. Right? You know, to be rolled up, there's some some way, some dimensionality. It's got to be thin. Secondly, if it can, in order to be rolled up, it's got to be able to be bent, and it has to be bent towards something else, which means there is an additional dimension beyond the dimension of space itself in order for it to be rolled up. You follow me? You can take a two-dimensional sheet of paper, and if you roll it up, you're dealing with three dimensions. And that's the same insight here. We don't know how many... Take, we don't know how many dimensions space is, but whatever there is, there's one more. So it can be rolled. Follow me? Now, scientists understand the non-emptiness of space itself. Maxwell speaks of his displacement current and vacuum polarization. Dirac speaks of the electron C, and Pauli has his exclusion principle. But that's beyond us. Let's, let's get to thermodynamics that you and I can relate to. There are three basic laws. We'll only deal with two of them, of thermodynamics. The first is the law of conservation of matter and energy. I think all of you had this in school, and that is that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be converted in different forms. Energy can go into mass, mass into energy. That's what the E equals MC squared of Einstein's thing, E energy. The E equals MC squared. The C is the speed of light. But the point is that's the conversion factor. A little bit of matter creates an enormous amount of energy, but you... But the law of conservation says you can't create it, you can't destroy it. That's an acknowledgment of Genesis 1, by the way. But let's go on. Another way of summarizing this, it says you can't win. Okay? No matter what you do, you can't destroy it, you can't get more. You've got what it is, whatever it is, it is. Now this, by the way, is in the Scripture. Genesis 2, verse, uh, verse 2, 3. And the seventh day, God ended his work. There's no more matter and energy created after day 6. None. People like to say, well, the stars are creating new matter. No. Whatever they're doing, they're converting from the past. Why? Because on the seventh day, God ended his work. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Hebrews 4, 3, 4. His works were finished from the foundation of the world. There isn't creation continuing. It's done. All the things that are there in Nehemiah 9, 6, you preserve them all. These are all allusions, if you will, to the conservation of matter and energy. Well, thermodynamics, we took the first one. Conservation law. The second law is perhaps the most profound one for us to all understand. It's called the law of entropy, also called the bondage of decay. It basically says that in any thermal trans transaction, there is a loss. You can't have an engine that's 100% efficient. No matter how hard you work, whether it's friction or some other factors, some of the energy involved will be lost to the ambient environment. And... Uh, the ambience is, is if, you look, if you think of it as randomness or entropy, that's why they call it the law of entropy. This basically says you can't even break even. Not, you can't win, you can't break even. <laughs> Whenever you do anything, there's going to be a loss. You convert gasoline to electro you know, mechanical energy, you're going to have some losses. And, and, and that's a basic understanding in every field of science except one. Every field of science understands the tyranny of the second law of thermodynamics. There's only one field of science that chooses to ignore it. That's biology. Because that, you cannot, 
you can just dis- dismiss the theory of evolution if you understand the laws of entropy. Now, this is also in the scripture, Psalm 103. It says, they shall perish, but it's being of the earth, thou, but thou shalt grow, but grow old as a garment. Uh, Isaiah 51, 6, the earth will grow old like a, a garment. Heaven and earth shall pass away, Matthew 24, 35. There is in the scripture this acknowledgement. It's also everywhere we look. The entropy laws are operative everywhere you look. Let me give you another, a non-thermal example. You spend all day Saturday cleaning up your garage. You put, you put energy in it by putting everything in some kind of order. What happens a week later? The random processes do what? Cause the order to disintegrate. It can be a school locker at, at, at school. It can be a filing cabinet at home with all your bills or whatever. You, you spend a lot of effort to get it all straightened out. But then as time goes on, unless you're attending to it, unless there's an input of more energy, it's going to go to what? To randomness. If we started talking about the dimensionality of time and talked about time going backwards, and let's assume we talked enough about that that you got concerned, because you begin to realize that if time's going backwards, all our measuring sticks are also going backwards, how could we tell whether they're going forward or backward if everything's relative? There is a way. You go get a deck of cards, and you shuffle them. If you had a deck of cards that were all random, and you shuffled them and they, and a couple times and came out in bridge order, would you be uncomfortable? <laughs> you wouldn't know why. The reason you would why, because you've, you, 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 the entropy laws like are called the arrow of time. You can tell what direction time is going by following, are we going from order to randomness? Now, in local situations for temporary things, there can be accidental order, but that quickly dis- evaporates, gets uh, overruled. But anyway, entropy shows up as a description of the creation in the Bible. Romans 8 says, because the creation itself will be set free. Speaking of the when Jesus brings all things to restoration. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. And it, it alludes to this in several ways in, that, in, in Romans 8. Now, there's a couple of lessons you can draw from thermal decay. It, heat always flows from hot bodies to cold bodies. Right? You may not notice that here in Los Angeles, but when you live in Idaho on a cold night, let me tell you, when Nan's feet go in my back, I can tell when, <laughs> yes, okay. Heat flows from hot bodies to cold bodies. Um, if the universe was infinitely old, then the temperature throughout the universe would be uniform. That becomes pretty obvious. Well, the temperature is not uniform. Therefore, the universe is not infinitely old. This is one of the strange proofs, crudely stated, that the universe had a beginning. Why? Because it's been winding down. The entropy law is required. The universe had a beginning, and by the way, it's destined for an ending. Even speaking just thermodynamically. Well, Genesis 1, we read that. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and uh, we went right through this. And God, and the... And the uh, uh, the first, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Day one, to be more correct. Now, let's talk a little bit about the vocabulary here. Uh, darkness, I mentioned I said, but uh, he separated the light from darkness. The word is kosek, uh, which is uh, darkness or like, like a black hole. But there's another word that's, uh, that I mentioned before I want to just emphasize. The term for first day in the Hebrew is yom echad, which means day one. It doesn't mean first day, it means day one. They're diff- What's the difference? The first day means it's one of a series that are relative. No, day one is absolute. And that's what, uh, it's very interesting that the grammar requires that. All the rest of them are relative terms, second, third, fourth, whatever. But here's the interesting word you want to understand, and very few people do. And that's the word erev. The word, the original root was made an allusion to chaos or disorder. And because as things as you get to nighttime and it gets dark, your ability to discern order goes away. The word comes to mean later evening. And today, if you say Arav Tov, that means evening good or good evening. Arav Tov in Israel, okay. Laila Tov is a good night. Uh, Boker Tov is good morning. Bokar is another word that refers originally, the root originally signifies orderly, discernible. 
And when, when, when it's dark and you can't discern anything and dawn starts and you begin to be able to discern order as you wake up from your tent and look out or whatever, the term comes to mean morning. Morning in the sense that it's the beginning when you can discern order. So Erev and Boker today mean evening and morning, but that may not be what they meant way, way, way back. The roots may have meant something more slightly abstract. Now, I have on the screen here an entropy profile of the universe. Horizontally, starting at the left, going to the right, is time. Day one, day two, day three, etc., and so forth. Vertically is entropy. Get used to the idea that the higher you are on this scale, the more confusion and disorder and randomness is existing. As you lower entropy, you create order and organization and design. You follow me? And so we have a week of... Now, what happens, of course, there's an Erev and a reduction in entropy called creation, and Boker, the close of that day, the evening and the morning, were day one. And God obviously created things in day one. You can get that from Genesis 1. Then there was an Erev and a, a, and a Boker and a lowering of entropy, that is the in, insertion of information, the insertion of design, and that's listed for you in your scripture, that is the second day. Then we have Erev, another evening, and, and the creation, and the morning. Evening and the morning were the third day. And then the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Each time, entropy is being lowered. That is, information is being inserted. There is information ex from the external system being input by the Creator. Erev and Bokar, the fifth day. Erev and Bokar, the uh, sixth day. We're together. Over on the right here, you see, Bokar is equivalent to, to order, and Erev, chaos or disorder or confusion. Are we together so far? What you notice what happens then on the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested. Check your scripture and see if you can find a morning, an evening and a morning of the seventh day. Don't misunderstand me. Obviously, there was an evening and a morning, but there wasn't in this text an Erev and a Boca, which begins to give us a clue. What does Erev and Boca really mean? It means today it's used to mean evening and morning, and that's the reason the Jewish calendar denotes the day starting at, at sundown, you see. Because you know, if you know the Jewish calendar, it starts at sundown from the evening you know, and so on, from, from, uh, from, uh, night, from nighttime to the next nighttime. Now, it's because of the way the, those words are used. However, that may not be the signification uh, in uh, creation week. Well, so we are at the, at the end of the seventh day with entropy at its lowest point, or putting it another way, the creation at its most highest design level that it ever achieved. Okay? Then something happened. We don't know whether it was on day eight or when, but that's Genesis 3, follows ch chapter 2, right? The fall of man. And that changes everything. And we have the curse, which is, does what? It introduces entropy. It starts a decay. It's from Genesis 3 onward that we know the creation, that we have history as we know it. You and I have really no information other than what the Lord has given us in His Holy Word on what the world, what the creation, what the plants, whatever, was like prior to Genesis 3. We have no idea. We do, we, everything we know about the universe is post-curse. There was another major trauma, and that, of course, is the flood of Noah. And the earth probably changed far more than we realize. We get some clue to this by a few verses here and there, and especially the decline of the lifetimes. The mortality of man descended from virtually a thousand years down to 120 and then down to what? Three score and ten over some period of time, gradually. And uh, that can all be uh, uh, modeled in terms of an entropy profile of the universe. Are we together? Okay, now, we talked earlier... I showed you these six spiral galaxies. I just I could have chosen any kind of astronomical figures. I, I, I chose these six for a very specific reason. They all happen to be what astronomers call a spiral galaxy. 
The first one is 2 million light years away, apparently. The next one, 18 million. The next one, 25. The next one, 32. The next one, 65. And the, the, the one, the sixth one, 106 million light years. Now, there's something very interesting about all six of these. They vary from 2 million light years to over 106 million light years. And yet, you notice all the, uh, the arms of the spiral are about the same. They're roughly the same. Well, that's very curious because the galaxies that are the, fir- the they, let's assume that we're looking through a telescope and all that light arrives right now, right? The ones that are further away had to start that light traveling 106 million light uh, years ago. The ones that are only 2 million had, you know, in other words, the ones that are way, way out there had to start first, right? They had to release their light long before the light was released from the ones that are only 2 million light years away. You follow logic so far? That means the further galaxies did not have as much time to rotate and twist their arms. That means that the closer galaxies should have the most twist. Because by classical reckoning, the furthest ones away are the youngest because they the, the light had to travel longer to get here. And yet they're not different. So these distances must have something to do other than actual dynamic time. Now, if the speed of light itself was a million times faster in the past, that would account for them all being so similar. In other words, if they really are that far apart, and they seem to be, the assumption that everybody makes is that the speed of light's a constant. And there's evidence accumulating the speed of light was not a constant. It was really, really fast way back there. And it may have started slowing down at Genesis chapter 3 because of the curse. This gets us to a discussion of the measurements of the speed of light. C is the conventional scientific denotation for the speed of light. Equals mc squared and so forth. Way back in the 17th century, um, Johannes Kepler and René Descartes and others took for granted that the speed of light was instantaneous, or the speed of light was the speed was infinite, or that light itself happened instantaneously. And because of the stature, especially of Descartes, that was just something you didn't argue with. Everybody just knew that it had to be infinite. The speed of light had to be infinite. It was not until 1677 that Olaf Romer, a Danish astrolog- astronomer, measured the elapsed time between eclipses of Jupiter and Io, one of its moons. And he did it in such a way that one end of the orbit or the other, you could get, in effect, a measurement of the speed of light by that technique. And by measuring this very carefully, by measuring the eclipses of the the Io and Jupiter, uh, he determined that the speed of light was finite, roughly 300,000 meters per second. For 50 years, scientists didn't believe it. The evidence was there, but they argued and waved their arms, and no one bought the idea. You know, I'm always amused by this, because scientists like to say they're so objective. You go through a history of science, you discover very quickly that scientists put on their pants one leg at a time. They're people. They have prejudices. They have emotions. And when they invest themselves in a viewpoint, it's very hard to get them to uh, shuck that investment. And so no, uh, no, no different than theological debates or other kinds. So it took 50 years for the scientists to finally give, cave in. In 1729, James Bradley, an Englishman, confirmed Romer's work. He did the same experiment again and proved that the speed of light was finite, had a, def- a measurable definitive speed. And it uh, took 50 years for the scientific community to catch up with it. Over the last 300 years, light has been measured 164 times at least by 16 different methods. Now, uh, some years ago, a guy by the name of Barry Setterfield, a physicist in uh, Adelaide in, uh, in Australia, and a mathematician friend of his, Trevor Norman, Nan and I just returned from a wonderful trip in Australia and New Zealand. And one of the things I set out to do when I was in Australia this time, we've been there many times, but was to search out Barry Setterfield, and we had a chance to meet. Very, very charming, charming guy, and... Uh, the recording of that afternoon uh, we will have available because it was a very interesting discussion. Very, very sweet Christian guy, but and, and a very, very interesting thinker. But he, anyway, he and uh, Trevor Norman, Barry Sutterfield, Trevor Norman, 
collected the raw data as best they could from all these past measurement speed of light. The, the data from 1677, Olaf Romer, he concluded that the speed of light was 307,600 uh, kilometers per second, plus or minus a, a error range of about 5,400 kilometers per second. Okay, not bad for a first shot. 1875, let's just pick another data point, Harvard University, using the same method that Romer did in 1875. They did it to, their error by then, of course, you know, you had, you had uh, a couple of centuries go by, so their technology is a lot better at Harvard by then, and so their error rate is only plus or minus 13 kilometers per second. But I want you to notice the mean number, 299,921. They don't even overlap. There's distributions. It's slightly less. 1983, National Bureau of Standards, 299, 792.4586, plus or minus 0. 0.00003 kilometers per second. Much more accurate, of course. But you notice something interesting? A little slower. You see, each one of these measurements are always less. Speed of light seems to be slowing down. Now, you can't tell from these data points, but Alan Montgomery, a Canadian statistician, took their data on a computer and, and felt that he got a 99% correlation with a cosecant squared. It's a curve. But going back in history, the speed of light may have been several million times faster than it is today, back in the many, many early years. Now, are there other confirmations? Well, actually, way back in 1927, a French astronomical journal published an article by Debray uh, based on measurements over 75 years that the speed of light might be slowing down. Simultaneously, but independent of uh, Barry Setterfield, uh, Trotsky, the uh, Radio Physical Research Institute in Gorky, he's a, a Russian cos uh, um, cosmologist, in 1987, suggested the speed of light's been slowing down. But perhaps the most interesting one, and by the way, you should understand this is very controversial. Most physicists today still cannot accept the idea that speed of light is not a constant. However, T.Z. Van Flanderen, who is a uh, top uh, scientist with the U.S. Naval Observatory, in 1981 published some very interesting dis discoveries. He discovered that the atomic clocks at the United States Naval Observatory were slowing down in, against dynamical time, dynamical time or orbital time, time as measured by orbital movement. And that's the way the Bible would talk about time because that's what he made, the, made them for. But if you use that as a base, orbital clocks, the atomic clocks seem to be slowing down. Now, that gives us a dilemma. Oh, and by the way, before I go back into that, uh, just recently, in our January newsletter this year, uh, we published the fact that a couple of guys have uh, published, are, are anticipating the publication. In fact, this, we got this out of the London Telegraph, but published, expecting in the Physical Review, one of the most prestigious journals, uh, the suggestion that time, the speed of light is, in fact, slowing down. On the one hand, I was uh, charmed to see it finally because it's been, this has been sort of a, a fringe area among physicists, and this is a very prestigious journal. Uh, I was very disappointed in the article because they failed to mention, even in passing, Barry Sutterfield's landmark discoveries of many years ago, which is a form, in my opinion, it would seem to be somewhat of a, uh, some snobbery there. But let's talk about atomic time. Prior to 1967, if I asked you what was a second, you'd tell me it was 131 millionth in a fraction of one orbit around the sun. In other words, it was defined orbitally up till 1967. Since 1967, a second has been redefined as uh, some, nine, some nine trillion, in some numbers, oscillations of the cesium-133 atom. The point being that the definition of a second change in 1967, for some standard reasons, from an orbital definition to an atomic definition, what wasn't obvious to many physicists is all the attempts to measure the speed of light slowing down by atomic clocks would be ineffective after 1967 because whatever is changing, the atomic clocks are changing with it. And that's something that was just relatively recent. See, if, let's put it the other way, the atomic clocks and the orbital time are not agreeing. Well, if the atomic clocks are correct, that means the orbital speeds of Mercury, Venus, and Mars are increasing. Well, that violates the law of conservation. In other words, the energy coming from And they're not increasing. If the gravitational constant is truly a constant, then atomic vibrations and the speed of light are decreasing. The very nature of space itself is changing. It's, see, if a, 
If the planet's orbital speed uh, increase, it would violate the law of conservation. If the atomic clocks are correct, the gravitational constant should change, and no such variations have been detected. So therefore, we know that there's a basic, basic change going on. Now, as an aside, if the basic nature of space is thus atomic time is slowing, clocks based on radioactive decay would yield ages much too old. And this kind of correction would bring radiometric clocks more in line with other methods. It's interesting that no primordial isotopes have half-lives less than 50 million years. They may have simply decayed away when the radioactive decay rates were much greater, basically. Now, this gets into the properties of space a little more hairy, but if the atomic frequencies are decreasing, then there's at least five properties of the atom, Planck's constant and some others, that should also be changing. And statistical studies support both the magnitude and the direction of these changes. This has been reported in the literature. So what are the properties of you may it may shock us to understand that there are actual this space that that the scripture says can be torn and bent and rolled strikes us as strange because we think of vacuum the empty space as being empty that's our view of it because that's all we can perceive no it has electrical uh, permittivity it's an electrical property it has permeability in terms of its magnetic properties and these are constants that are well known in physics they have an intrinsic impedance they have the velocity of light derives from these same characters because both Velocity of light is, is a, uh, uh, the square root of one over the product of both permeability and permittivity. These things are all, the point is that these things are all related. So if one's changing, the other things are changing. That's the point of it. There's also, here's the shocker to most of us, there's an energy in the absolute vacuum of space. That's a shocker to most people. I've always read about the zero point energy, and I didn't realize how, I always figured it was something very minuscule and something only of theoretical value. No, I'll come back to that. But the main point is, if any of these properties change, then both, the, then both the atomic behavior and the velocity of light would vary throughout the universe simultaneously. It's an, it's an uh, intrinsic property of space. Now, what is the zero-point energy? It's at absolute zero, the residual energy in absolute vacuum. What is it? It turns out to be estimated about 10 to the 95th power ergs per cubic centimeter. That doesn't mean anything to you and I, because that's a scientific term. Let's do an analogy. What is 10 to the 95 ergs per cubic centimeter? How much energy is that? Visualize the power of the sun. That itself is ambitious. Try to think of that. Multiply it by 100 billion over 100 million years. That's the energy that's available in every cubic centimeter of empty space. I don't know what to say to this. Except maybe quote Job thirty-seven twenty-three, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. There's another thing you should be aware of. You know, we've talked scientists have talked for decades, of course, about the red shift. It's the basis of the Hubble's law. This idea that that the that the stars shift to the red because they're moving away from us. Well, there's a couple of interesting scientists. One is Halton Arp in Germany. Another one is William Tift, William A. Tift in the University of Arizona. They've spent the last number of decades collecting information on what they call aberrant red shifts, red shifts that are going the wrong way, that aren't conforming to Hubble's law. William Tift has made a discovery that is very, very disturbing. He discovers that the red shift data, if you look at it carefully, is quantized. That is, it always shifts in steps. You can't find red shifts at some arbitrary continuum. It's a, in other words, the difference, if you can think of the difference between a violin string and a piano key, a violin string you can put wherever you like. Sometimes it sounds good, sometimes it doesn't, but it's up to your skill. You can make any sound you want on it. A piano, you're hitting key, you're limited to the keys. You follow me? I'll call a piano digital. I'll call the violin analog. The red shift is not analog, it's digital. That is, it turns out that it's always a multiple of a specific number. A, little, a very small number, but a specific number. Now what this means is, it's not obvious, is that the red shift may not be caused by the Doppler effect. There's a lot of reasons to believe it doesn't anyway. It may be caused by a change in basic atomic behavior, where the basic properties of space are changing, causing the electron orbits in the atoms to change, and that's causing the shifting. And uh, there, Barry Sutterfield has, pub- has uh, submitted a paper to the physics uh, journals uh, to uh, get that published. He's done the... Ar- it turns out, it's not obvious, but it turns out that this redshift quantization is another evidence of the apparent slowing down of the speed of light. Well, so we sit here <laughs> in a universe in which, on the one hand, our scientists are learning a great deal about, it, about, about the universe. 
We're learning a great deal about physics, quantum physics and the rest. But as we stand back from all of this, we find that everything that they've talked about is anticipated in the Scripture. And I have uh, stayed short of trying to build a cosmological model of the universe derived from the Scripture. You know, what, what, what we need to do, obviously, is study the Scripture carefully and try to take what we think we really know about physics to try to put this together into a model we can visualize. So far, the ones that I've had the opportunity to review fall far short, one way or the other. The, the Big Bang models uh, are under great criticism by cosmologists anyway because they, as you try to reconcile mathematically what we think we know uh, about the physical laws, it, they don't quite compute. We know it had a beginning, but exactly trying to structure it some way has all kinds of other problems. Russ Humphreys wrote a book called Starlight and Time. And while some of his conjectures uh, are, are ones that I think need a lot more thought, in my mind at least, I have to take my hat off to him because, as a scientist, he starts with a scriptural text and builds from there. It builds a model. So it's a very provocative book to read. Uh, I, st- I think there's still a lot to be, uh, to be learned about this. But the good news, I think, is that the more we learn from the Scripture and the more we think we understand from physics, the more it fits together. What we've got to be careful of is not to bring to the text or to our scientific endeavors our prejudices. When we read about Ederv and Boker, yes, it sounds like even in morning, evening and morning, but there may be behind the, that terminology some much more profound meaning. And uh, this indeed is another what I might call a cosmic code as to what really happened. Because the only observer that was there that actually did it was the author himself, and he has given us his record of what happened. So on the one hand, the place in this that we know where we stand is to stand on the Word of God because we know it's right. That doesn't mean our understanding of the Word of God is correct. We may be understanding it through the lens of our own prejudice and presuppositions. But we don't have to cower or apologize or be embarrassed by Genesis chapter 1 or any other chapter or verse in the Scripture. We just need to go at it humbly enough to realize that our perceptions of it may be frail or incomplete or myopic in some sense. They certainly are. But it is fascinating that as we do understand the Scripture and as we do understand what the discoveries of the laboratory, we're getting more and more insight into the strange reality that we live in. We've discovered, just to touch on a couple of other things, we've discovered there are two concepts in mathematics that are very convenient conceptually, but they are totally absent from our universe. One of those concepts is infinity. Those of us that have studied mathematics, you come across the idea of infinity, where two parallel lines meet. Well, they never do meet. So where's infinity? Well, it's a long way that way. Well, uh, it turns out that uh, most of us, especially as we grew up, figure, well, infinity, that's, just, that's way beyond the stars. It's out there somewhere. Uh, it turns out that with a finite universe, there is no infinity on the macrocosm, on the large scale. The universe is finite. It's bounded. There is a point. It may be a long way away. There is a point at which it ends. It doesn't go forever. That's, a, that's something for most of us. It's just a conceptual issue, but it's an important issue. It means that infinity doesn't exist in that direction. It also doesn't exist in the microcosm, the microscopic sense. If you and I, say, take a yardstick and cut it in half and get 18 inches, okay, we could take the half and cut it again and get 9 inches, say, right? We think in our minds, whatever we have left over, we can always cut in half again. And then again, and again, and again. We may not be able to mechanically cut it when it gets really, really small, but in our mind's eye, we can visualize, no matter what it is, I can always cut it in half. turns out that's not true. There is a length that you can't get smaller than. It's 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It's called the Planck length. Getting smaller than that causes whatever you have to lose locality. That doesn't mean it disappears. That means it becomes everywhere at once. Ooh, really? Same thing happens with time. You say, gee, I got a second. I can take, cut it in half. You get a half a second. I can get, get a quarter of a second. I, that, I get an eighth of a second. I get down to shutter speeds of a camera. and I get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. 
no matter how small I get, I can always make it smaller yet with better technology. No, that's not true. You can't get smaller than 10 to the minus 43 uh, seconds. It doesn't exist. There's units of mass, energy, length, and time that you cannot get smaller than. And the discovery of that fact is the basis of what we call quantum physics. That's why they call it quantum physics, that everything is digital. It's made up of a fundamental small molecule, but smaller than that doesn't exist as we think of it. And this has gotten even more complicated. And the more you read in the field of quantum physics, the more bizarre this universe begins to look. Niels Bohr, the atomic scientist, says anyone that isn't shocked by quantum physics doesn't understand it. Uh, Richard Feynman at uh, Caltech has also said another way. He says that uh, unquestionably, there's nothing wackier or sillier than quantum physics, except it is unquestionably correct. Uh, Einstein went to his death, frustrated, convinced that, that there must be another way to look at it. And, and I won't start on all. In fact, one uh, Boltzmann uh, committed suicide, couldn't handle the implications of what he believed he understood about quantum physics. Um, and yet, our microprocessors, our lasers, all these things depend on quantum physics. It's a very strange, strange world. And uh, Alan Aspect, uh, University of Paris, with his colleagues, proved the Bell inequality, which in effect seemed to demonstrate that every proton, or let's say, excuse me, every photon in the universe is immediately connected. Every photon knows what every other photon is doing, in effect. It's too complicated to get into an analysis of that here without some diagrams and stuff. But the point is, this leads to a property of physics called non-locality. We deal with this in our book of Cosmic Codes because it turns out that David Bohm, confrere of Einstein, uh, was very troubled by this because he discovered in studying plasmas at Livermore and elsewhere that gases of ions, I mean uh, clouds of ions, act like an organism. They seem to all know what every el- the other ones are doing, and that bothered him to try to model that and understand it. And when he discovered holography, he was thrilled because he began to realize that in the hologram, you've got a kind of model that might explain the whole universe. In effect, he seemed to come to a view that this entire physical universe that we know is a simulation, a digital simulation, uh, a holographic simulation effect. The real reality isn't here. It seems like it is. No, the real reality is outside that, beyond that. We might use the glib cliche, the spiritual world. But when we think, when we use the term spiritual world, most of us are guilty, I think, of visualizing something ephemeral, something that is it really there exactly? You know? No, it's the other way around. It's what's really there. And you and I are participating in uh, a very, very elaborate simulation. It's interesting that um, I think it was Paul Davies, the uh, scientist, that said it's as if the entire universe is nothing more than a thought in the mind of God. I kind of like that. I don't know what it means, but I kind of like that. <laughs> There's another concept that, does, that exists in mathematics and is very practical to use, but doesn't exist in real life. It's called randomness. There's a concept in mathematics and probability theory and so forth of a random variable. A variable can have arbitrarily any value, a random variable. It turns out most of us would think that there are random variables. I go to Las Vegas and pull that lever and there's a random variable, okay? Or I can roll dice or I can play a, you know, a game of what we call a game of chance. That, that's randomness. And indeed, some of that behavior does fall some broad stochastic laws. But it's interesting that even in a computer, they have what they call a random number generator. There is no such thing. A random number generator is a uh, program that will generate a string of numbers that have properties as if they're random. But you have to charge the random number generator with some kind of arbitrary start. You have to charge it. And they usually do that by... Uh, taking the second hand when you booted it up or some arbitrary thing to get it started. There is no, they, they, as they grope for a random number, there really ain't one. Now you say that's kind of silly. No, there is a field of mathematics that has emerged on this very issue. It's called the theory of chaos, where mathematicians are studying those things which we think of as random. There are some things that are very deterministic. Uh, the, all the equations we learn in school, you know, F equals MA or any of these the idea of cause and effect, that this is caused by that. We learn those things and they have mathematic relations. We call those deterministic. But what about a a box of tacks that are thrown on the floor? How those tacks lay out? Those are random. Well, not really. 
One theoretically, if they knew all the physics of the velocity and how hard you threw it and what angle, you know, presumably you could argue that every one of those would be predictable some way if the models were elaborate enough. Uh, the the uh, distribution of a debris after an explosion, we think of that as random, but it turns out mathematically it ain't really. And the study of these kinds of strange things is called the theory of chaos. It turns out that they're beginning to realize that conceptually you can't find random, not true randomness. You can find things that seem random. And as I grope with this, I'm always amused as I read these papers, is because that's what the Bible said in the first place. The lot is in the lap of the Lord. Einstein is famous for, in arguing with one of the physicists, he says, God does not play, God does not play dice. He's famous for that quote. He wouldn't accept certain kinds of statistical issues. And I think, I forgot who it was that uh, Roger Premrose, I think, said, uh, if he did, he'd win. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, of course, exactly what the scripture says, that God is in control of the, uh, of the day. And that means that you're here tonight by a divine appointment. How'd you come here tonight? Well, you may have heard the remark on the radio or some friend dragged you here kicking and screaming or whatever. Um, you're here tonight. And you're, if we understand the scripture correctly and we apply what we think the mathematicians are telling us, you're not here by accident. God may very well have some cosmic purpose in your being here, being here tonight. And so, lest I take my extra time and use it up abusively here, uh, let me <laughs> get back to a few scriptures and we'll close. We've talked a lot tonight about the heavens, the expanse of space. And Psalm 19 summarizes very well. The heavens do what? They declare the glory of God. And the firmament, there's that word again, showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Indeed, that information goes everywhere. Their line has gone throughout all the earth, their, and their words to the end of the world. I love the next verse, verse 5. He says, In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth, that is the sun's going forth, is from the end of heaven, and a circuit unto the ends of it. And there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. And verse 6, I love that when I was in high school. Uh, his circuit, it said, there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. There's thermodynamic, uh, you can relate that to the laws of thermodynamics. Nothing hid from the heat there. And I had a skeptic saying, yeah, but it says his going forth is from the end of heaven and uh, from one end of, and the circuit unto the ends of it. And that's silly. Copernicus shot that. That's the Ptolemaic cosmology that the sun goes around the earth. We know the sun doesn't go around the earth. This is old-fashioned Ptolemaic cosmology. Copernicus taught us that we revolve around the sun. My skeptic hadn't done his homework. Because while we revolve around the sun, what's the sun doing? It's revolving in the galaxy. How long does it take to get around? I think it's something like 25,000 some years. I've forgotten the number. The sun does literally go from one end of our galaxy to the other. And uh, neither Ptolemy nor Copernicus realized that, I don't believe. But it's here in the scripture because it's going from the end of heaven and a circuit into the ends of it. Nothing hid from the heat thereof. Uh, before I leave this Ptolemaic Copernicus thing, I will share with you without trying to add it to your burden tonight of proof, I have the strange view that the Earth is the center of the universe. Now, my Einsteinian friends will argue with me that you know, they'll say that everything's relative, and I say, fine, if everything's relative, then any reference I choose is as good as any other, and I choose the Earth. <laughs> but I also think, and I haven't developed it enough to really present it yet, but I also believe you can show that the Earth is the center of the universe, despite all the other orbital complications that surround, that, that in effect thus surround us. And uh, the one that comes closest to these kinds of perceptions that I've found is uh, Russ Humphrey's books uh, tend to uh, build on this uh, basic approach. I build it on because of things Jesus said. I think that Hades and Gehenna are opposites. Sheol, or the boat of the dead, is where? I think I know where it is. It's at the center of the Earth. Why? because it's, it's associated with the abyss, the bottomless pit. Where is there such a thing as a bottomless pit? There's only one place that you can have a bottomless pit. And that's at the center of a sphere. Because at that point, every direction's up. 
And uh, you know, it reminds me of the, the famous uh, little uh, riddle we had as kids. Two hunters set up camp, and they went 10 miles to the south, found bear tracks. They followed uh, 10 miles to the west where they found the bear, and they shot it. And they carried it 10 miles to the north back to camp where they skinned it. You go through it in a longer version, but basically the question is, what color was the bear? White. White. Very good, because the only place you can go south, west, and north, and back to where you started is at the pole, of course. So it's a polar bear. But the point is that it, it, the, the little the geometry of the riddle deals with the idea that there are certain points that all directions are equivalent. From the North Pole, all directions are south. The South Pole, all directions are north. From the center of the earth, all directions are up. A bottomless pit is a place where there is no bottom. It's a bottomless pit. And uh, we know that the, the boat of the dead is in the belly of the earth. As the Son of Man, as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man spend three days and three nights where? Belly of the earth. So I know where he was. Where's Gehenna? Not there. It's in the outer darkness, whatever that means. And so anyway, you know, moving on, before we lose up all our time, let's remind ourselves specifically of the person who's involved with all this. And that's in Colossians chapter 1. Speaking of Jesus Christ, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, who hath translated us into the kingdom, kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him... Were all things created. That includes the firmament. All things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, doesn't say most things, all things were created by whom? By Jesus Christ. And for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, or more precisely, all things are held together. I believe he's the source of that 10 to the 95 ergs per cubic centimeter that is the zero-point energy of even absolutely empty vacuum of space. Well, our whole ministry, of course, is based on two key discoveries, that you and I, here in our laps, have an integrated message system. 66 separate books penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years. And yet, it's an integrated message. Every number, every place name, every subtlety of the original text is there by supernatural engineering. Secondly, though, you can prove that the source of this integrated message system is from outside the dimensionality of time itself, outside our time domain. And you do that a uh, number of ways. You can do that by its anticipation of our most advanced scientific discoveries. But you can also, even more so, discover it by its recording in detail history before it happens. And all you have to do is look at our horizon understand what the Bible says and understand what's going on in Europe, in the Middle East, in China, wherever. It's all part of a scenario that's been laid out in great detail in the Scripture, and it's as timely as today's or tomorrow's newspaper. Well, I talked before about this timeline. I spoke to the people in the past of being in, in the past, and we're here in the present, and that scientists argue about is it possible to go back in time? Is it possible to... To, uh, to reverse, to somehow reverse entropy, go back in time. And if you ex and that's a very popular theme in literature because many people like to play with this idea because if you go back in time, the fear is that you create paradoxes. What happens if you go back in time and kill your grandfather? Then you never become born. So you, you create, and, and there's a lot of fun literature. The, 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 the writers for decades have had fun with this, uh, the, the famous time machine story and other things. There are lots of them. We have uh, more modern versions of uh, going, you know, Back to the Future and, and tongue-in-cheek uh, spoofs of these things, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in time is a romantic thing. Again, these themes of time reversals. Is it possible to go back in time? The mathematicians say yes. The physics, physicists say yes under very peculiar conditions. A positron may be an electron in a time reversal, according to a Nobel Prize in physics not long ago. Well, I don't know about all of that, but I do know there was someone who entered the time domain not to alter our future, but to fulfill it. He went back in time, you might say, and he entered the time domain. We're, these are the people back there, this is us. He entered time and wrote us a love letter. That love letter was written in blood on a wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. Everything in the entire created universe is going to be measured by its relationship to that event in history 
on a cross erected in Judea virtually 2,000 years ago. And that everything includes you and me. If you were to die tonight, heaven forbid, on the way home, and you were your destiny throughout eternity, once you leave this time domain, will be determined by your relationship with that person. Do you know about him? Or do you really know him? You see, I think we're entering a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history. And if that's true, the events that are looming on our horizon are going to get stranger and stranger and stranger and yet more and more conformity to the ancient biblical scenario. And I think some of us in this room will have the opportunity to give our lives for our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think biblical Christianity is going to get increasingly politically incorrect. And knowing Bible verses won't be enough. Memorizing your scripture won't be enough. What you know about him won't be enough. Knowing him is the only thing that will get you through the kinds of periods that may be coming to try them that dwell upon the earth. So I encourage you, if some of these ideas have disturbed you, praise God, that may be the Holy Spirit nudging you to reconsider some of your priorities. I suggest that no one leave this room tonight with any apprehension about their cosmic destiny should something cause you to be confronted with your Creator in the near term. Why? Because you can leave this room with your eternity sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we praise you for the opportunity to gather together here this evening. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that gave us this word and that, has, that will illuminate it to ourselves and our lives. We also thank you, Father, that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidence, no randomness, <laughs> that it's a totally entropy-free universe as far as you're concerned. And that means, Father, we're all here right now by your design, by your ordination. We thank you, Father, for that privilege, that opportunity. We pray, Father, that the lessons not be wasted. We pray, Father, that you would accomplish your purpose in each of our lives. And, Father, indeed, we recognize there may be some among us who have yet never really made that commitment of themselves and their lives and their destiny. Put that in the hands, in your hands, Father pleading nothing else but the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we acknowledge before your throne that we are without any plea, without any defense, that we are sinners, that we are helpless in cosmic things, that we are totally the beneficiary of what you have done for us, not by any merit that we have, but entirely by your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, that you have gone to such extremes that we might live, that we might bear fruit for you, that we might be in your forever kingdom, in your forever family. We do pray, Father, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, just reveal yourselves to us. Let us feel your presence. We pray, Father, that you would illuminate that path before us. For those of us, Father, that have never made that commitment, Father, we just pray right now that you would receive us. Take over. Guide us. Father, for those of us that have made those commitments in the past but have drifted away from your priorities, we pray, Father, that you would help us with our resolve. Give us discernment in our decisions, Father, and give us resolve in our commitments that we indeed might be your redeemed sons and daughters bearing fruit to you as we commit ourselves this night into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, the Mashiach of Israel, and our King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. 
for a complete listing of materials to further enhance your personal Bible study or to receive a free one-year subscription to Chuck Missler's 32-page Christian Intelligence News Journal. Contact Koinonia House at 1-800-K-HOUSE-1. That's 1-800-K-H-O-U-S-E-1. To fax your correspondence, dial 208-773-6312. Or you can write to Koinonia House at P.O. Box D, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, 83816-0347.